Well, so, you know, it's, I don't want to keep people too long tonight. So I think the first thing I, I was going to do this evening is just talk a little bit about what cancer is and what it's not. Um, and, and mind you, the, the term cancer is a very big word in the sense that it encompasses a lot, but at the same time, it's not very specific. When people oftentimes, for instance, ask the question of us, well, gee, you know, does this blood test test for cancer? Um, you know, I have to say, well, there are dozens, if not hundreds of different types of cancers that exist. And, uh, you know, fundamentally one shared feature is that, you know, cancers arise from totally normal cells in the body. Something has to go arise. Usually, you know, there, there's, uh, for example, there, you know, could be abnormalities in, in, in the DNA, which cause a normal cell to begin to grow out of control and, and not respond to the normal cues in the body that would arrest its growth, arrest its division and prevent it from growing uh, and perhaps even spreading around the body. And, you know, if we're having somewhat of a general conversation, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a, a change uh, in the DNA, although oftentimes that's, that's, that's a root cause. Uh, and this is something, by the way, that can uh, occur you know, because of errors with respect to the way DNA is copied. It certainly can occur in response to certain environmental toxins. Um, you know, for example, in cats, you know, we, we sometimes recognize that, you know, even secondhand cigarette smoke could trigger uh, lymphoma in, in, in some of our patients. So, um, but fundamentally, you know, when we talk about cancer, we're talking about normal cells in the body that start to grow out of control. Um, and uh, so that is the sort of a shared feature of all cancers, regardless of the, uh, you know, cell type from which they arise. Um, and, you know, when we talk about a diagnosing a cancer, again, there's no one set uh, protocol that's followed because based on where we find evidence of cancer, uh, you know, the way that we arrive at the diagnosis is going to vary quite a bit. Getting back to the earlier point I made with respect to uh, blood tests and cancer, which we'll sort of revisit here in, in just a little bit. Um, some of the routine blood work that we frequently do when we have a patient who's not feeling well does have the ability to uh, identify or at least suggest certain types of cancers and perhaps even help localize uh, that cancer to a particular part of the body. But rarely does that first series of tests give us a definitive answer. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how we sort of go through this process, not only to arrive at a diagnosis, but also to determine how much of the body is actually affected. Um, and, you know, when it comes to diagnosis, ultimately the thing that we really rely on is having a sample of that tissue in hand. Um, that may come about because we can do something as simple as putting a needle into a lymph node, for example. Sometimes it requires removing a mass or at least removing part of a mass and sending it to the laboratory. Um, these days, you know, we, we actually, in some cases, like, uh, you know, even go beyond that. For example, we, we send a tissue sample to the laboratory and somebody looks at that sample under a microscope, but um, there's only so much you can tell um, from the physical appearance of, of the cells. And therefore, especially these days, we have a variety of uh, tests that allow us to distinguish between different types of a particular cancer. Uh, Tony, you had mentioned lymphoma and there's many different types of lymphoma. So we have uh, different types of tests that allow us to distinguish between those different types of lymphoma, for example, um, which is oftentimes you know, necessary information to help us decide on the best treatment protocols, as well as to give owners some sense of, okay, you know, what do they have to look forward to um, based on the treatment options that are available. And, and I, I, I sort of, you kind of want to hit on this point pretty hard because, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, if you're not used to this type of thing, either on the human side or the veterinary side, the expectation is that people come in thinking, okay, well, we do one test and we get our answer. And that's rarely ever the case um, because, you know, once we arrive at a diagnosis, then we sort of leapfrog into the next stage. And this is actually a, a sort of a, a process that we refer to as staging. The idea being that we, once we arrive at a diagnosis, whether we've really drilled down to know exactly what type of variant of a particular type of cancer we're dealing with, we also really wanna know to what extent it's affecting the body. Um, for those of you who may know people who've had, uh, you know, 
cancers, you know, oftentimes they'll talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, three A, four B, things like that. And what we're doing here is we're really looking throughout the body to determine which organ systems are affected. That can not only affect our treatment decisions or at least our treatment options, but it also tells us something about the prognosis that we ha may have to look forward to. And, and certainly in the case of cancers that are, that are uh, more difficult to, to deal with or cancers that have a high rate of metastasis, meaning they, they can readily and at times quickly move around the body, you know, in veterinary medicine, that's particularly important because that can significantly affect the decisions that, that a client chooses to make. Um, and the process of staging really, it, it's not, it's a series of tests. I mean, for better, for worse, we, there is no single test that we can do that'll give us all the information we need. And what I mean there is oftentimes we'll begin the, the investigative process with you know, some blood work. And, and oftentimes we'll get to the point where we'll you know, put a needle or take a sample of tissue, send it to the lab to identify what type of cancer we're dealing with. But then we wanna know where else the cancer is present. So oftentimes if we wanna look in the, the chest cavity, for instance, we might consider something like x-rays or radiographs. Um, these days, we oftentimes consider things like CAT scans or CT scans to sort of render a three-dimensional image of the chest and determine how the cancer is affecting the organs that are present there. In veterinary medicine, uh, unlike in human medicine, you know, ultrasound for us is a very, very useful tool. Oftentimes, to get a full picture of what's going on in the belly, on the human side, they'll use a CT for us ultrasound oftentimes can accomplish the same goal, but admittedly there are times when a, when a CT is, is necessary. Um, and mind you, you know, keep in mind that when we do blood work, when we do imaging like ultrasound, we're using sort of the total amount of information we're getting, even though some of it overlaps to assess what's going on with, with our patient. Um, oftentimes, depending on the type of cancer, we may need to go beyond that. You know, we may need to, for instance, take a sample of the bone marrow we may need to, um, uh, you know, take samples of, of other organs that we suspect may be affected. So ultimately, the way that we go through the process of staging is at some point dependent on the diagnosis that we arrive at when we send a sample of the tissue uh, to the laboratory. And, and there are established standards depending on the type of cancer, you know, whether it's something called lymphoma, an angiosarcoma, you know, bone tumors, whatever we're dealing with, there are accepted standards for assessing which organs are most likely to be affected by a primary tumor if it were to move around the body. And, you know, those are obviously the guidelines that we follow. Um, in reference to uh, seeing oncologists, oftentimes, you know, before a, uh, we send a patient to the oncologist, they want all that information in hand. And certainly it's, it's, um, uh, you know, we sort of better provide both for you and your, your pets when we do that, because they have all the information they need. And right then and there, they can sit with you and, and, and talk about the various options that are available uh, and, you know, and what the outcome likely looks like. One thing I, I do want to point out that we sort of get mired in sometimes, and I think to be fair, we get mired in it a little bit too much, is when we're talking about the outcome you know, either the outcome of a patient, uh, if we treat them versus, you know, if we don't, we often talk about averages, median remission times, the, you know, the how, for how long does the average patient seemingly go cancer-free after treatment? In other words, we're talking a lot about numbers and statistics, and uh, it's very easy in doing that to have people kind of latch on to what is the best case scenario. And when having these conversations, I, I really try to emphasize the fact that while we could potentially tell you what members of a population might do or how they might respond to a therapy, at the end of the day, we don't know how the individual sitting in front of us is going to respond. And that's something that somebody has to remember going into this process is that um, even with all the information that we have, and sometimes at a, at a very sort of base level, if we're looking at, for say, DNA mutations, we still won't know what the patient in front of us or how they're going to respond until we try. And so sometimes when you go down this road of treating a patient for a cancer, um, you kind of have to take a, 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 oops, excuse me, a, a leap of faith in the sense that you have to, obviously you want to hope for the best, but we just won't know until we try. There, there really aren't uh, a lot of predictive tests that'll tell us, 
yes, if we do this, we're going to have a 80% chance for, for a cure. I mean, it, it, it'd be nice to have them. And in some very, very specific cases, uh, some of these things exist. But by and large, until we start treatment, we really won't know what we can expect. Um, and so again, the process of staging is one that's, that's necessary. Uh, it's not one you want to skip, simply because you don't want to embark on going through the process of administering chemotherapeutic agents, dealing with any potential complications, and certainly um, have to deal with the expense if we don't have a really good chance for success. And I, I think it bears mentioning that certainly, you know, there are those situations, um, for example, we have an isolated tumor on the skin or just underneath the skin that we can remove and perhaps affect a cure. But it's a word that we don't use very often because it can be a real challenge, especially with cancers that, that you know, are affecting a patient systemically or in, are sort of present in the general circulation. So I wanna be very careful and not overemphasize that. Our goal in veterinary medicine is obviously to ultimately do right by the, the patient and give them the best quality of life. But to be fair, there are certainly circumstances where I have a conversation with them and say, look, I can give you some more time, but if you're asking me whether it's good time, whether it's it's time that you really you and your your pet can enjoy, I don't know that it necessarily will be, and that's a very real conversation that has to be had. And again, it goes back to this idea of never really being sure how a pet's going to respond uh, until we try. Now, you know, traditionally when it comes to treating patients with cancer, we sort of have sort of four types of therapies, some of which can be combined together. You know, I'm sure most of you have heard about, you know, chemotherapy, using drugs to attack uh, cancer cells. Um, in some circumstances, you know, we, we rely on radiation therapy, which is available here in the Valley. Um, there are certainly circumstances where surgery becomes the, the first line treatment for a particular tumor type. And then of course, um, there are certain circumstances where we've had for a while um, immunotherapies, you know, where we use uh, basically a strategy such that we're able to prime the immune system to sort of attack uh, the cancer. And again, sometimes you'll mix and match these therapies. In fact, it's very common to do so. Uh, but the choice of, of traditional therapy very much depends on the type of cancer we're dealing with. For example, you know, lymphoma, which is a very common sort of systemic cancer uh, of dogs and cats where you have white cells that, that sort of grow uh, out of control. I mean, those white cells are normally circulating in the body. So, um, you know, even if you have, let's say, an enlarged lymph node caused by these cancerous white cells, removing it alone is not going to affect or provide much of a, a, a difference to the patient because it's in the general circulation. An alternative, obviously, is, a, is an isolated mass that might be on the side or the flank, um, one that's, that, that arises from cells that are present just underneath the skin. And you know, if you're lucky enough, if it's identified early, you can, because of its location, for example, do a very aggressive surgery, remove all of it, and hopefully avoid, um, you know, having the cancer cells spread around the body. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to mention here is that, again, the, the, the choice of treatment is very much individualized, not just to the cancer type, but it's also very much dependent on what an owner seems or, or determines is going to be the best fit, you know. Oftentimes when we have conversations about cancer, people frame the choices as right or wrong, um, best or worst. Um, and the truth is, it's rarely a situation where it's, it's, it's slow, so black and white. Um, are there reasonable choices um, based on you know, what we know from the veterinary literature? Sure, um, but you know, unlike in human medicine, Quality of life is, I shouldn't say unlike human medicine, but quality of life is everything. And I'll be perfectly honest and say that cost has to be a consideration. I mean, if cost wasn't a consideration, you know, perhaps we treat every patient, but there are certain circumstances and certainly certain cancers that are so aggressive that the cost and that the potential outcome from treatment doesn't justify the time and expense. And I, you know, I say that as having had two of my own pets pass away from cancer. Um, it's difficult to accept. And, and, and I'll be the first to admit in both cases, I may have waited a little bit too long thinking that as a veterinarian, I just had to find the right colleague who had the answer. Um, 
But the reality is sometimes the fairest thing, the most dignified, the most humane choice is not to pursue an aggressive course of therapy um, because the outcome, we're not gonna change the outcome. We're not gonna change the end result to any significant degree. And so it's okay not to treat, not treating a patient, but keeping them comfortable is very much a reasonable option to make as is when necessary, the, the idea of youth, you know, euthanasia. I mean, it, it, the reality is, as I said earlier, it, it's not often that we talk in terms of a cure. We try to give them the best quality of life we can for quite some time and hope for the best. But tonight, one of the things I wanted to focus on certainly is some of the newer therapies, some of the new, I'm gonna say cutting edge things that are out there. And, and the first thing I'm gonna say is that um, and, and perhaps Tony, this, this, this would apply to, to your situation, is that there are always clinical trials that are going on. Um, clinical trials, basically there are uh, studies that are being conducted by cancer specialists, oncologists to look at new drugs, novel combinations of drugs, um, even novel combinations of different types of therapies in order to evaluate their success at treating a particular cancer, certainly in reference to a more accepted standard. Um, there's actually a clinical trial database, but you know certainly if you're in a situation where um, you would consider uh, participating in a clinical trial, um, you know we have access to the data. Certainly, the oncologists do, and oftentimes these days, it's not necessary to travel to the particular institution or facility uh, that may be conducting the study. Um, they can be conducted remotely. Um, so that is one of the first things to consider, and it doesn't always mean we're going to have great success, nor does it mean that your pet may fall into the, um, the sort of uh, group of pets that are actively receiving the, the, the agent they're testing. It is possible that your, your pet could receive a placebo. Um, and, you know, these are all considerations, obviously, that have to be raised and, and, and thought about when deciding to participate in a clinical trial. But they do exist and they're constantly, they're ongoing. And ultimately the goal of these clinical trials is to look for therapies uh, or, or combination treatments, if you will, that provide an outcome better than what we currently see, uh, or at least provide an option, maybe one that's safer with fewer side effects than what we currently have available. Um, and I'll point out that it's rarely a situation where we have to deal with just one option for treatment. In other words, you could use, you know, employee surgery, you could be part of the clinical trial, you could use chemotherapy. There's a whole sort of variety of ways that we can approach this. But some of the very new things, there's, there's four things I wanted to touch on that, uh, that are very, very new. When I say new, they've come on scene in the last couple of years, um, which full disclosure means that we're still gathering a lot of data about how successful they actually can be either as sole treatment options or as adjunct to more traditional therapies. Um, and a lot of these really sort of revolve around looking at the DNA of cancer cells. Um, the first one though, I, I wanted to talk about um, is sort of uh, came on scene. It, it's called Torrigan or the name of the company that, that offers the therapy is called Torrigan. And the idea here is something that I sort of referenced earlier. That is to say that we want to use the body's own immune system to target the cancer cells. And so oftentimes what's involved here is that when we remove a tumor um, or we are sampling tumor tissue, we actually send some of that tumor tissue to Torrigan. And in turn, in their laboratory, they actually develop, um, let's, well, you know, for lack of a better term, a vaccine, if you will, that is then administered to the patient from which the tumor came from. And again, the idea is to teach the immune system to recognize the cancer cells as foreign invaders. You know, much like your immune system would see a bacteria circulating in, in your blood as something foreign, something that needs to be removed. Um, because again, cancer cells arise from, the, from your body's cells. Um, they can fool the immune system. So here with the Torrigan therapy, we're really trying to teach the immune system to target these cancer cells and go after it. This is actually a strategy that was first um, brought or introduced uh, in veterinary medicine now, gosh, about uh, 24, 25 years ago in reference to uh, melanomas, which do occur in dogs. And certainly Torrigan is now expanding on that therapy. And certainly I can tell you from experience, it can be used either as a sole therapy or as an adjunct um, to uh, uh, more traditional therapies. 
But to be fair, we don't have a lot of data uh, independent of what the company provides about its success. So this is definitely one of those therapies that sort of falls into the, the, the sort of the experimental bucket, if you will. And again, you're, you're, you're taking a leap of faith, hoping that it provides some benefit, but it is available um, for, you know, potentially a variety of cancers. Um, one of the therapies that was on scene and unfortunately has sort of fallen off, um, but admittedly uh, seemed very promising was from a company called PetDX. Um, the, the idea here was that we could identify certain gene mutations that were tied to particular cancers. Um, specifically, what this test allowed us to do is that we looked for what's called cell-free DNA circulating in the blood. And if this DNA with the key mutations was present, it was indicative of the fact that this patient very likely had this cancer present in the body. Now there's some pitfalls there. It doesn't tell you where the cancer necessarily is, but it acts as a screening tool, not just to augment um, our assessment of a patient who might say be at risk for cancer down the road, or to be used in a patient who had surgery to see if this patient's cancer free. And there were a number of, of potential applications. And I say it's sort of fallen off the grid because unfortunately the company that, that um, pioneered this therapy is uh, no longer functioning. Um, but there is a new, I shouldn't say new, there's an alternative strategy that's still available to us. Um, it's called the new Q testing. And it kind of does the same thing. It looks for a different marker, if you will, in the bloodstream for a lot of the common types of cancer. So for example, cancers of white cells like lymphoma or cancers of blood vessels like hemangiosarcoma. Um, and to varying degrees, it, it has the ability to indicate whether one of these cancers might be present in the body. Again, it doesn't really tell you where that cancer is. So additional testing you know, is oftentimes necessary. The test is, is, is currently marketed as one that um, potentially acts as a screening tool in breeds that may be at high risk for certain types of cancers. For example, we oftentimes associate uh, lymphoma uh, as being something that, that like a golden retriever would be at very high risk for. And there are other potential applications, but again, it's a very new therapy. Um, the data that's available is somewhat limited. And, you know, I, I don't want to say I, I take it with a grain of salt, but I think it remains to be seen uh, whether this test on a large scale uh, over its use in large populations really is going to provide us with the sensitivity that we need and the confidence, more importantly, to take the result at face value. Because certainly no one wants to be in a position where they do this test, say, as a screening tool, have it come up positive, and then we go on a hunt for cancer. Um, but it exists. You certainly can find plenty of information online about it. And again, the new Q test and the PETDX test were similar, or they were taking a rather similar approach. Um, and I think you'll find certainly in the coming years, more and more companies are going to be looking at this strategy. Uh, but one of the most promising and certainly one of the most exciting, uh, in my opinion, is um, by a company called Phytocare. And they have really done something rather novel. In veterinary medicine, you know, we have a whole complement of, of, of chemotherapeutic agents that we use to treat a variety of cancers. But if you look at the, if the, the body of cancer drugs that are available on the human side, it dwarfs anything that we have on the veterinary side. And what they've been able to do, what Phytocure has, has developed, is a technology that allows us to take uh, some of the, the, the tumor tissue. And what it does is it, it they're able to identify gene mutations in the cancer cells that came from your pet. And because of the information that we have from the human side, they can perform some tests to determine if there are human drugs that we don't oftentimes use that may be effective against the specific type of cancer that we're dealing with. Again, I had mentioned early on that, you know, if we talk about a patient having, say, lymphoma, for example, there are many different types of lymphoma. Not all lymphomas behave the same way. So being able to target a therapy to a specific mutation that's present in your patient really has a lot of potential. And, and at the same time, it's something that can be used as an adjunct to more traditional therapies. One of the, the interesting things about this, this approach is that, again, it's based on 
an extensive body of literature that's present on the human side. So I would describe it as a little less experimental than the other therapies. Um, one of the nice things too, is that they make available to us as practitioners, not only a sort of a whole host of specialists like cancer specialists, but pharmacists that enable us to actually um, package and prepare the drug in a way that um, makes it sort of easy for owners to administer. Because of course, if you're going to be administering medications at home by mouth, you do have to be careful that you don't expose yourself to any of those. Um, and of course, one of the interesting things about all these therapies is that while in many ways they're new, novel, and in some cases experimental, um, they're not, at least as far as cancer therapies go, astronomically expensive. Um, you know, and, and like I was saying before, cost is always a consideration, uh, but relative to the some of the more aggressive protocols that we might use for uh, certain cancers, for instance, lymphoma, um, they tend to be quite reasonable. Um, but I, I find that the, the technology and the science behind uh, the phytocure strategy uh, is very, very sound and is continuing to expand as we get more and more offerings on the human side that we can sort of walk over to the veterinary side. And, and again, perhaps the most novel and valuable thing about this whole strategy is that we can look for specific mutations that specific drugs can have a positive effect on. And that's never been available to us in veterinary medicine before. So it's an exciting, uh, you know, an exciting strategy. Right now I have personally one patient who uh, is going through traditional chemotherapy for a tumor type called hemangiosarcoma, which is a, a very aggressive, very fast growing uh, tumor that in dogs oftentimes arises from the spleen. And on top of that, um, Phytocure was actually able to identify a gene mutation to which we had a drug um, that we could use to target this. And at least the preliminary data they, were, they have from other cases suggests that the combination of the traditional approach and the more experimental approach could significantly prolong this patient's life and maintain its quality of life well beyond what we experience with traditional treatments alone. So um, I, I think there's a lot of promise in that strategy, perhaps even more so than, than the other three that I had mentioned. And you know, it's something that at times is worth exploring. Um, especially if the options that we have uh, from a, a more traditional approach really don't provide us with the results that we're looking for. Um, so, you know, there's a number of different strategies and to be fair, uh, beyond sort of the, the more traditional approaches of using chemo or radiation, um, you know, these are some newer strategies which we think can be very beneficial. Um, in reference to um, some of the more traditional strategies like uh, the use of radiation, we do have a facility here in town uh, and some radiation oncologists. So uh, veterinary cancer specialists who focus, excuse me, who um, specialize in just administering radiation, um, we, we do have that capability. It's, it's not inexpensive and it does require a fair amount of, um, uh, you know, time commitment unless you choose to house your patients at the facility during the course of therapy. Um, but it is something that we have available. And it's not always available to, to folks, even in oftentimes in smaller cities. Um, and we also have sort of the good fortune of having a number of surgeons in town who have the requisite experience to, to perform cancer surgeries, even in complicated or advanced cancer surgeries um, to you know, accommodate the needs of our owners. Um, so I kind of wanted to leave it there and, and sort of open up the, 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 the conversation, if you will, because you know, we could sit here all day and talk about all this sort of you know, variations on a theme, uh, we'll talk about specific cancers and, um, you know, this could go on forever, but I wanted to give you guys a chance to sort of address or ask specific questions that may be of interest or concern to, to, to you. If anybody has them, I guess. I guess I have, it's Jean. I, I have a question about screening really. Um, and you touched on the fact that golden retrievers are you know, kind of have this affinity for getting cancer. And obviously we just went through that with Lou un unsuccessfully, you know, um, it was too far along. And so I know there'll be another golden retriever in the future, I, I, like screening. I mean, you mentioned screening and, and then, and then what, you know, you, you have this indication and then maybe I guess you've got to go chasing for where it is, but you know, it's, it's kind of a, a conundrum to me where you go looking for it to begin with, but that was somewhat of a lesson. I think I've 
think I might have learned from you know this past experience is by the time you find it, the two times I've had two golden retrievers, two for two, it was too late. Like so, you, know, and, and, you know, that's a great question. And and the pet DX and UQ technologies were, I think, in part developed to try to answer that question. In other words, if you had a technology that had a high degree of sensitivity, meaning it 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 could detect even the smallest amount of, if you will, cancer in the body, um, and do so reliably, then in, for example, certain breeds, you would perhaps start performing this test. Maybe you know once a year when they would come in for their you know, their annual wellness um, to see if it was present. And of course, it's it's I think it's fair to say that if it caught early, we have a much better chance of, of being successful at treating it. Um, the problem as it stands today is that um, you know these tests admittedly do need to develop be developed to a higher degree. Um, unfortunately, um, you know even with respect to lymphoma, one of the more common sort of generalized or systemic cancers we deal with. Um, if you look at the data concerning this, this new Q test, it's not as good as it should be. Um, it's not as sensitive uh, or specific, I should say, in the sense that you could get a positive result that has nothing to do with cancer. Mm. Um, so it, it is a conundrum. It is difficult. And it, it, in answer to your question, you know, when would you do the tests? Um, what other tests you could do? I mean, yes, you're right. We could do testing ad nauseum, you know, every six months, every year. We could still miss something in the interval. Um, and we're really just at the very early stages of being able to provide any sort of predictive information. I mean, ultimately, it would be great if you could sort of look into the DNA, if you will. But admittedly, there are mutations that take place in DNA later in life that wouldn't be present early. Um, sure. It wouldn't necessarily identify. So I don't know that I have a fabulous answer or solution to that problem. I don't know that it exists at the moment. Well, I guess at this point, I didn't know really there was screening that existed. So, you know, even at a level that it is now that's good knowledge to have for you know the future so i appreciate that it looks i mean like i think this had a question in your chat too oh yeah was it. I, I think the screening is there but honestly um at least with those two tests that act as more screening tools i still think they have a relatively long way to go to yep. refine them to make them really useful tools um I mentioned them only because you'll begin to see some materials out there even on social media as they're being marketed and i think it's a bit of a uh, they do a bis bit of a disservice to owners because I think they promise more than they can deliver. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have an idealized situation, great. If you get lucky, great. But that's not often the case. And so I, I, I it's something we sort of discuss gingerly, um, recognizing that that um, you know it, the promise of these technologies is 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 amazing. But the reality, as it stands today, it doesn't doesn't sort of measure up to that promise. Um, so uh, Trina asked, okay, is there a correlation between multiple lipomas and any type of cancer? As I understand it, no. If we're talking about these benign sort of fatty tumors that dogs get, no. There's no association between um, the presence of those lipomas and, and other types of cancer, to the best of my knowledge. Um, nor is there an association between um, you know, necessarily one lipoma and another. I mean, oftentimes they can occur all over the body of the dog, large breed dogs, small breed dogs. Um, they're not spreading, but the same sort of, I don't want to call it de novo, but the same sort of change in those fat cells is likely present in fat cells all throughout the body. Hence the, 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 the growth of these tumors and not to pick on a golden, but oftentimes in old goldens, they can be all over the place. You know, you can have 12, 15 of these things and they can be range in size from you know, the size of a dime or a quarter to a softball or even even bigger at times. Um, but no, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of any connection between the presence of those lipomas um, and other types of cancer. It, it, just as a side note, there is a, a fatty tumor called a liposarcoma, um, sort of a, a the malignant cousin of a lipoma that can grow and become invasive and, and become somewhat problematic. They are admittedly very, very rare. I can only think of one I've seen in my nearly 25 years of being a vet. Um, but no, the common type of lipoma that we're uh, that you're used to seeing or dealing with, no association. I'll also point out that because we all sometimes find ourselves as veterans in the situation where we're feeling a lump, and you know, owners are like, well, "What does it seem like? What does it feel like?" Well, 
and truth be told, none of us are uh, have you know uh, fingers that are sort of schooled in pathology. And you can get a sense of what it is, but to be perfectly honest, until we have actually have a sample, we can't be sure. Um, so uh, I know I can sometimes say, well, I'm pretty confident this is a lipoma, and, and it probably is, but for certainty, or if you want to establish certainty, you ultimately need a sample of it. And I'll point out that just in terms of sampling, oftentimes with many types of tumors, we can actually just use a needle, similar to what we would use if we were administering a vaccine and extract a very, very tiny sample, put those cells on a slide and oftentimes get the answer that we're looking for. However, there are certain tumor types that tend not to what we call exfoliate well, meaning they don't give up their cells very readily. And in those cases, we often need to take a small piece of tissue in order to arrive at our answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just, I, for my dog, she has multiple lipomas and she's had one, well, she's had two of them biopsied. One was the needle aspiration that you were talking about and the other one actually sent out some tissue during a surgery and sent it to a lab. But I didn't know if it had a propensity to like, develop sarcolipoma down the road. No, no, lipomas don't don't morph into to lipos. Okay, perfect. Are, Thank you. Um, you know, there are just a couple of more rare tumor types that I can think of that can sort of perform that that sort of um, go through that process, but it, it's 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 a, it's a rare one. Okay. Thanks. Hey, You're welcome. Hey, Josh. It's 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 Tony. I have two oh. questions. So, with the lymphoma, if there are multiple lymph nodes that are enlarged, is that indicative that the cancer is spreading throughout the body, or is that just the immune response for the body to so you know, to to demonstrate that? With respect to lymphoma, it's actually a very common thing for us to see them coming in with multiple large lymph nodes. Um, okay. Lymphoma is derived from lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a white cell present in circulation all throughout the body. Um, so, you know, in theory, you have lymph, uh, excuse me, lymphocytes in every organ system of your body. Um, you know, but the, the, what we call the sort of the generalized form of lymphoma, causing a, what we call a generalized lymphadenopathy or general enlargement of the lymph nodes, is a very, very common presentation. Um, I would say it's probably one of the more common presentations that we actually see in general practice. Um, that doesn't make it necessarily more or less severe, if you will. Um, it's rare to see only one lymph node enlarged, although it does on occasion happen. Um, I, I would say that with respect to lymphoma, one of the bigger sort of differentiators is whether it falls into the category of being what's called a B cell or a T cell lymphoma. Um, that is to say that there's, you know, lymphocytes perform different functions. And when possible, we have more options, certainly more success when we're dealing with B cell lymphomas than with T cell lymphomas. Um, okay. So that, that's, a, that's a, you know, a bigger, um, perhaps a more important piece of information to have. Um, you know, it's also important to know how many other places, uh, you know, the tumor tissue, excuse me, the, the tumor cells may be present, but it's also a difficult question to answer. And I'll point out that when we go through the process of staging, there are limits with each test uh, with respect to um, the point at which we can detect the cancer. Take, for example, uh, on, on, on x-rays or radiographs of the lungs, um, which many of us would use as a first line assessment uh, to determine if there's cancer spread to the lungs. Well, you know, beyond a certain point, we cannot resolve certain very tiny masses. Now, CT can do a slightly better job and there are certainly other more advanced imaging modalities that one can, can bring to bear. Um, but this is what I was sort of alluding to before, is that there's no one single test that'll give us uh, a, a complete assessment of how much of the body is affected. And um, you know, th this goes to that sort of uncertainty of how a patient is gonna respond ultimately. So we do the best we can with the available technology that we have. Um, but again, in reference to your question, no, the most common presentation to see a dog come in with multiple lymph nodes in March. Okay. And then my second question is that you talked a lot about advancements in treatment of the cancer itself. If a determination is made that treatment doesn't make sense because of the type of cancer, the age of the dog, so on and so forth, have there been similar advancements in the palliative care or is it yeah, prednisone mean, is the, is the go-to? I mean, certainly, yeah. I mean, prednisone, a steroid is sort of the old sort of standby that we used to say that, you know, no pet should you know, 
every pet should at least have the benefit of steroids. Um, you know, but these days, you know, we do talk about the use of cannabinoids, CBD, for example, in some circumstances. There are um, certain types of mushroom extracts, which at least have demonstrated some efficacy with certain types of, of, of tumors. Um, you could make an argument that for certain types of tumors, you know, putting them on a patient on a very restrictive diet potentially has some, some advantages. Um, you know, there are some therapies or treatments that I'll say fall sort of into the alternative realm, which at some of which can actually be used with more traditional therapies, um, but they are available. Um, again, they're gonna depend on what type of, of, of tumor we're dealing with, what cancer we're dealing with, but yes, absolutely do. They are present. Um, have I seen them be successful? Yes, I have. Um, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I would say that it's something if somebody really wants to explore from the get go or, you know, the overall prognosis is a poor one, but they want to give it a shot. I think it's reasonable if they can complement a more traditional therapy, one that we actually, you know, have real data on. I always think that's a sort of a nice adjunct to consider. Um, you know, we even have special diets these days to support patients who are dealing with, with cancer or cancer therapy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the simple answer is yes to your question. I, uh, and just, I've, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. Just a quick uh, question. Does your practice then administer treatment or is it just referral to an oncologist? So right now we do administer chemotherapy. It's not something that, uh, I mean, I've been doing it for I guess close to 25 years now. Um, full disclosure, we're having sort of an internal discussion um, as to whether we're going to continue to do it based on some changes in the laws. Um, we have for the last few years uh, worked with an oncologist who used to actually work at a facility here in, in the Valley, but she decided to work more as a consultant. And so she meets with clients uh, at our hospital uh, via Zoom, discusses all the therapies, discusses all the options, the outcomes, um, and then has us administer the actual medication. Um, the internal dialogue we're having just has to do with some of the changes in regulations and whether we can meet the sort of safety guidelines that come along with, with using chemotherapeutic agents. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I've been doing for, I guess, I'm sad to say over several decades. A question of all the cancers that you see, um, which would you say were probably the most eminently treatable? And I've had Goldens that have had, I mean, run the gamut of different cancers. What do you, what do you think, think would you, would you would you think would, you would think? be the most treatable? Well, if we talk about systemic cancers, cancers that are more likely to be diagnosed um, affecting the whole body, certainly lymphoma ranks up there as one of them. I mean, it is a, it is a, with more aggressive therapies, have I seen patients cured? Yes, I have. Um, the, uh, so lymphoma ranks right up at the top um, uh, for systemic mm -hmm. cancers. And certainly it's one of the more common cancers that we see uh, in, in many breeds. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. As far as systemic cancers are concerned, um, I, I hate to say this, but I think there's a sort of a big drop off in terms of, of our success rate. Yeah, it's sad to say, but keep in mind that the money devoted to cancer research and veterinary medicine is a tiny fraction of what exists on the human side. So what we know obviously comes from studies that are performed. And now we're just at the point where hopefully we can use information or uh, you know, data on the human side and apply it more directly to the veterinary side. But that's always a big obstacle. Um, but I would say from a systemic cancer point of view, really it's lymphoma and everything else drops much farther down the list. Localized, uh, what I'm gonna call tumors, um, certainly mast cells, mast cell tumors, which are very common in dogs, um, can be uh, very easy to treat. We can successfully treat them with surgery. Um, Admittedly, uh, there's a whole variety of tumors that occur in the skin or the skin layers uh, that we can approach the same way and essentially affect a cure because they have a very low potential or a very low probability of moving around the body. That term we use is, is to metastasize. Um, you know, admittedly, there are, uh, gosh, other types of cancers, um, you know, even internally that when identified early, can be resected and removed. There are certain types of liver, liver tumors, for example, or even tumors 
you know, of the adrenal glands, um, even tumors of the intestines, you know, that when identified don't typically move around the body and they can be removed successfully and, you know, uh, approach if not provide a cure. Um, there are certain, I'll point out certain breed predilections. For example, we've talked about lymphoma and golden retrievers. Um, German shepherds are sort of the poster child for a tumor type called the hemangiosarcoma, which is a very, very fast growing aggressive tumor oftentimes starts in the spleen of dogs, uh, more often large breed dogs than, than, than small breed dogs. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, boxers, Boston Terriers, even pugs oftentimes have to deal with uh, mast cell tumors um, in terms of breed predilections. Um, at the moment, those are the ones that come to mind with some of the more popular breeds you know, that we tend to see. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions they want to float? No? Okay, well, um, gosh, I didn't realize we were talking for 45 minutes. Um, oh, Jean, yes. No, 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 I just want to say thanks. appreciate the information. Oh. And, um, You're welcome. I see you take the time to do this. Um, if you guys have more questions, you're welcome to, to certainly contact me at the, at the hospital. Um, it's very yeah. helpful. It's, excuse me. It's very helpful for me because I report work with Rescue of Golden and, and I report to all the vet care liaisons throughout the state, give them all this information. So it's helpful for them when they have to deal with it. So thank you so much. It's a, it's a, it's a somewhat of a difficult conversation to have to talk in general terms. It's easier when we have you know, a specific idea of what we're dealing with to really narrow the focus of the conversation and focus on, you know, what the treatment options are, what the outcomes look like. Um, but yeah, I wanted to provide just some general information tonight. Like I said, we'll post this on the YouTube page as well if anybody wants to revisit it. But thank you to everybody for joining me this evening. Thank you. Thanks, doctor. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome, everybody. Have a good night. You too. Thank good you. Night. Good night.